And would you turn with me, please, to Exodus chapter 9, as we continue our series in Exodus. And that's on page, it begins on page 51, if you're using the church Bibles, Exodus chapter 9. Page 51. Let's pray to God as we come to his word. If you join with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are those who seek to stand on the gospel of Jesus Christ. We praise and thank you for your word. Thank you that you have called us through your gospel, that by your word you have created the church through the Holy Spirit. We thank you that your word is reliable and true and that in it you provide everything that we need for our spiritual sustenance. We pray today that you would speak to us through your word, that you would guide our words and our thoughts and that in all these things we would glorify you. We pray these things in the strong name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. So, Exodus chapter 9, page 51. We continue with the plagues of Egypt, where Moses has to deal with Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Exodus chapter 9. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, Let my people go, that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let them go and still hold them. Behold, the hand of the Lord will fall with a very severe plague upon your livestock that are in the field, the horses, the donkeys, the camels, the herds, and the flocks. But the Lord will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt, so that nothing of all that belongs to the people of Israel shall die. And the Lord set a time, saying, Tomorrow the Lord will do this thing in the land. And the next day the Lord did this thing. All the livestock of the Egyptians died, but not one of the livestock of the people of Israel died. And Pharaoh sent, and behold, not one of the livestock of Israel was dead. But the heart of Pharaoh was hardened and he did not let the people go. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Take handfuls of soot from the kiln, and let Moses throw them in the air in the sight of Pharaoh. It shall become fine dust over all the land of Egypt, and become boils breaking out in sores on man and beast throughout all the land of Egypt. So they took soot from the kiln and stood before Pharaoh and Moses threw it in the air and it became boils breaking out in sores on man and beast. And the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils. For the boils came upon the magicians and upon all the Egyptians. But the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh and he did not listen to them as the Lord had spoken to Moses. Then the Lord said to Moses, Rise up early in the morning and present yourself before Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, Let my people go, that they may serve me. For this time I will send all my plagues on you yourself and on your servants and your people, so that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. For by now I could have put out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, and you would have been cut off from the earth. But for this purpose I have raised you up to show you my power, so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. You are still exalting yourself against my people and will not let them go. Behold, about this time tomorrow I will cause very heavy hail to fall, such as never has been in Egypt from the day it was founded until now. Now therefore send, get your livestock and all that you have in the field into safe shelter, 
for every man and beast that is in the field and is not brought home will die when the hail falls on them. Then whoever feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh hurried his slaves and his livestock into the houses. But whoever did not pay attention to the word of the Lord left his slaves and his livestock in the field. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand towards heaven, so that there may be hail in all the land of Egypt, on man and beast and every plant of the field in the land of Egypt. Then Moses stretched out his staff towards heaven, and the Lord sent thunder and hail and fire ran down to the earth. And the Lord rained hail upon the land of Egypt. There was hail and fire flashing continually in the midst of the hail, very heavy hail, such as had never been in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. The hail struck down everything that was in the field in all the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And the hail struck down every plant of the field and broke every tree of the field. Only in the land of Goshen, where the people of Israel were, was there no hail. Then Pharaoh sent and called Moses and Aaron and said to them, This time I have sinned. The Lord is in the right, and I and my people are in the wrong. Plead with the Lord, for there has been enough of God's thunder and hail. I will let you go, and you shall stay no longer. Moses said to him, As soon as I have gone out of the city, I will stretch out my hands to the Lord. The thunder will cease, and there will be no more hail, so that you may know that the earth is the Lord's. But as for you and your servants, I know that you do not yet fear the Lord God. The flax and the barley were struck down, for the barley was in the ear and the flax was in bud. But the wheat and the emma were not struck down, for they are late in coming up. So Moses went out of the city from Pharaoh and stretched out his hands to the Lord, and the thunder and the hail ceased, and the rain no longer poured upon the earth. But when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunder had ceased, he sinned yet again and hardened his heart, he and his servants. So the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people of Israel go, just as the Lord had spoken through Moses. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. For those who are younger and who wish it, there are fact finders at the back which will help you look at the passage with us and to understand and follow the sermon. I don't know if you've seen on your screens yesterday, you may have seen that Hurricane Ellen, I think it should be pronounced, hit Florida. And it hit it with great force. We see the wind from the hurricane hitting everything in its path until trees are uprooted and vehicles are blown away and houses are smashed. The hurricane is an irresistible force that meets resistant objects. In these fifth, sixth, and seventh plagues, the mass death of livestock, the dust that turns into boils on people's skin and on animals' skin, and the killer hail, we again see the hand of God, the irresistible force, stretched out against Pharaoh, against the heart of Pharaoh, the resistant object, like a hurricane striking things in its path. God sends these three further plagues to increase the pressure on Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, to release God's people from slavery. And these three plagues begin to affect the Egyptians in a direct way. If you were here last week, Todd did a great job in describing what plagues 2, 3 and 4 must have been like for the Egyptians. But I can't really do that this week. These plagues, numbers 5, 6, and 7, take us far beyond anything we would normally experience. We don't know what it's like for all animals in a country to die in one moment. 
or what it's like for everyone, human and animal, to have boils all over our bodies, or what it's like to see humans and animals killed by giant hailstones in a storm of fire. We've never seen anything like that in our own lives. We might see such things on our screens, in war or conflict, but even then those things seem far from us. Most of us haven't experienced anything as atrocious and as deeply traumatic as what is described in this chapter. These plagues that God sends are becoming really destructive. The Egyptians are beginning to lose their health and their means of existence and even their own lives. And God now directs these plagues only on the Egyptians, not on the Israelites. And he instructs Moses in verse 1 and later to refer to him before Pharaoh as the God of the Hebrews. From now on, God identifies only with his own people. That doesn't mean that God's power and authority only apply to Israel. His power and his authority are universal. He commands all peoples and all things. But he is at work now solely to release his people from slavery in Egypt. And God's power is an irresistible force. A hurricane seems irresistible, but there may be objects that can resist it. But nothing can resist God's power. Pharaoh had thought earlier in the book that his magicians would be able to neutralize what God was doing in the plagues. But now there is no one who can counteract what God is doing. These plagues go far beyond anything that Pharaoh's magicians can deal with. In fact, the magicians themselves suffer from the plague of boils, along with all the other Egyptians. The magicians have run out of answers to what God is doing. And these plagues are definitely from God. It's not just Moses trying to do things himself. In verse 3 of chapter 9, God says that the hand of the Lord will fall. God uses his personal covenant name, Yahweh, shown in the text by the word Lord in capital letters. God is doing things himself, even if his actions come through his servants, Moses and Aaron. And these plagues are not natural events, but they're supernatural actions of God. We see clearly that they are from God, from the fact that he says what he is going to do and when he is going to do it. Some people make promises about what they're going to do, but if they don't tell you when they're going to do it, it may not mean very much. But God says what he's going to do and when he's going to do it. In verse 5, God says that the fifth plague will fall tomorrow. Pharaoh had used the word tomorrow as a stalling tactic. But when God says he will send a plague on a particular day, it shows that it is from God. God isn't giving a weather forecast with an amber warning about hailstorms. God is taking action supernaturally. And there's also an element of grace about giving a day's notice of the plague. It gives time for Pharaoh to repent, time for him to change his mind and to let God's people go. And in the case of the hail, it gives time for the Egyptians to find shelter for those who believed God and obeyed his word. Those who suffered from the hail were those in the text who did not set their hearts to the word of the Lord, those who did not pay attention to and act in accordance with what God was saying. And we can see these plagues are supernatural by their very nature. Up to now, the plagues might almost have been natural events in an amplified way. But these three plagues couldn't be natural events. All animals don't die suddenly in a single moment in one country. Dust doesn't naturally turn into boils that cover the skin of all animals and people. And in verse 13, we read that the hail would be such as never has been in Egypt from the day it was founded until now. The hail is not just part of a natural storm with very large hailstones. It's a supernatural thing. God has sent it supernaturally. 
This is killer hail. It kills people and animals. It smashes all the trees in the fields. These hailstones are like huge bullets fired from a machine gun. And it's not just the hail that is supernatural in origin, but in verses 23 and 24, there is a fire within the storm, fire flashing continually in the midst of the hail. This is not natural lightning in the thunderstorm, but it's fire from God. The word for fire is the same word that is used in Ezekiel chapter 1 for the fire around the throne of God. And the fire moves through the storm and works lethal destruction as God's instrument. Its movement is described by the same word used for Abraham's journey through the whole of the promised land at God's direction in Genesis chapter 13. In the same way, in this supernatural storm, the fire moves at God's direction through the whole of the land of Egypt. The question remains in all of this, what is the state of Pharaoh's heart? If we have this irresistible force and the resistant object of Pharaoh's heart, where does Pharaoh's heart stand now? The answer is that through these plagues that are getting more and more severe, that he's still in sinful opposition to God. He continues to stretch out his hand against Pharaoh to make him release his people. I'd like to look at three things. First, the sovereignty of God. Second, disobedience. And third, obedience. First, the sovereignty of God. Who is our sovereign? If we're from the UK, we would say King Charles III. Technically speaking, in the UK, we're not citizens, but we're subjects of the king. If you have a passport and you look in the first page, you will see that it begins with a demand from the king that other governments treat us well because we are his subjects. But as Christians, as well as any earthly sovereign we might have, we have another sovereign, the Lord God Almighty. Our head of state can make us obey the laws of the country, to pay taxes, and in time of war to be called up to defend our country. But any power that he has is limited by law. And even our head of state is just a human being. He can't work miracles or change the course of world events. But God is the creator of the whole universe and is sovereign over it. He does have total control of all things. It was God, we read in this chapter, who made Pharaoh and raised him to power. In verse 16, God says to Pharaoh, For this reason I have raised you up to show you my power so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. God brings about everything for his glory including his work to save his chosen people. As Christians, the glorious sovereignty of God should be the main principle of our lives. We are to live for God and to glorify him in all that we do. Of course, this is quite a heavy passage, isn't it, these plagues? And sometimes in our own lives, it can be hard to see God's purposes in what happens to us and in the world. But as God confirms here, all the circumstances and events of our lives and in the world, however difficult they may seem to us at the time, are for God's glory. There is only one God, and he is all-sufficient in himself, but he has made the world and us in his good pleasure, and he has saved us purely by his grace, out of his love, and he has done so in order that we may know him and glorify him in our lives. Well, that may all sound a bit theoretical, but understanding God's sovereignty affects how we look at events in our lives and in the world. One idea that is put forward to explain events is that of primary and secondary causes, that God is the primary cause of events and human beings are the secondary cause, having free will under God's sovereignty. And in these events in Exodus, Pharaoh seems to have freedom to choose 
to obey God or to disobey him. And that's why he has responsibility for his own sinful actions. That's why there is human responsibility for sin. Paul wrote in uh, Romans 3 that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But at the same time, God is sovereign over all things, even over our choices, whether they're good or bad. Our decisions are not outside God's will, whatever, but work towards what God has planned. John Calvin, the Reformation theologian, wrote this. We declare by God's providence not only heaven and earth and inanimate creatures, but also the counsels and wills of men are so governed by God as to move precisely to that end destined by him. Man remains responsible for sin, but man's sin does not override the sovereignty of God. God does not originate sin, but even when man chooses to sin, God is still sovereign. We have to balance those different things in our understanding of events. So God explains his sovereignty to Pharaoh in verses 13 to 19 of chapter 9. He says in verse 16, I have raised you up to show you my power so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. Even Pharaoh's sinful disobedience in refusing to let God's people go is under God's control and is part of God's purposes. Even the plagues are part of God's plan. The plagues of Egypt are not a plan B because Pharaoh wouldn't let God's people go. God doesn't do plan Bs. God is sovereign. He is in control of all things, even Pharaoh's heart, even Pharaoh's disobedience. God has planned all of this. He has sent the plagues, he says in verse 14, so that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. And in verse 29, that the earth is God's alone. Of course, God could have done things differently. He says so himself in verse 15. He said that rather than sending the plagues to get Pharaoh to release the Israelites, he could have put out his hand and struck Pharaoh and the Egyptians with pestilence and they would have been cut off from the earth. God could just have wiped out the Egyptians instead of sending the plagues. So even the plagues show God's mercy. He sent the plagues rather than destroy Egypt completely. God is sovereign. He remains totally in control of all events, even the disobedient actions of Pharaoh. And he uses the means he has chosen to achieve his purposes, to proclaim his name in all the earth and to save his people. And God's sovereignty also applies to his saving of us. Paul wrote in, the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans chapter 9, citing Exodus 33, that God will have mercy on whom he will have mercy. It is God who calls us to faith, to faith in Christ. It is God who enables us to receive that faith in repentance and humility. God is sovereign. The question for Pharaoh and for us is how do we respond to God's sovereignty? There are only two responses, disobedience, or obedience. So disobedience. There are two kinds of disobedience. One is when you do what you are told not to do. Don't be rude to Auntie Mabel when she comes to tea. Don't break the speed limit. Don't speak with your mouth full. Don't talk back to your parents. The other kind is when we don't do what we're told to do. Do be friendly to Auntie Mabel. Do drive on the left, if you're in the UK. I know other people drive on the wrong side of the road. but Do your homework. Do finish all the food on your plate. When you read this chapter, you might think that Pharaoh doesn't actually do very much. So what is his disobedience? Why is he disobedient? How has he sinned? 
Well, his disobedience is of the second kind, not doing what God commands, not letting God's people go. And finally, after seven plagues, he confesses his sin in verse 27. If his sin was disobedience to God, not letting God's people go, what caused his sin? It all stems from his heart, from his sinful heart, from his view of himself and of God. Pharaoh thought that he represented the divine power of the Egyptian gods as the ruler appointed by them. Maybe he even thought that he himself was a god. In verse 17, God says to him that he's still exalting himself against God's people, and in doing so, he is exalting himself against God. The fact is that Pharaoh owes his existence and his kingship to God, as we have seen, for it was God who raised him up as king. So Pharaoh's view of himself is delusional. Even as king of Egypt, with all the immense power that he wielded, he's still under God's authority. And now he has come up directly against the one true God, and God wants his covenant people to be released to serve him and not to be Pharaoh's slaves any longer. Pharaoh thinks he has the right to keep God's people, and his sinful disobedience comes from his self-exaltation. Well, we're not like Pharaoh, are we? When we read this chapter, are we meant to think that we're like Pharaoh? We're not the absolute monarch of a superpower. Yet in our sinful nature, we are prone to self-centeredness, to self-exaltation, putting ourselves at the center of our lives, thinking that we can do our own thing without God, that we don't need God, we don't need to listen to God, that we don't owe God anything. Self-centeredness is the, at the root of all sin. If we are self-centered, if we put ourselves before God, then we are exalting ourselves over God, just like Pharaoh in his attitude towards God, the attitude that resulted in his sinful disobedience to God. We might think that we're not like Pharaoh, but we easily slip into the same sin against God. So seven plagues in, Pharaoh has recognized his own sin and that of his people. In verse 27, he said, This time I have sinned. The Lord is in the right, and I and my people are in the wrong. But even then, there remains a serious question as to whether or not his repentance is genuine. God used the phrase this time in verse 14 to show that the plagues were becoming more severe and closer to home. But when Pharaoh uses the same phrase in verse 27, it's to qualify his repentance. Maybe this time, just this once, I got it wrong, but not the other times. I wasn't sinful or disobedient then. Pharaoh still hasn't got the message. Or maybe he thought he could trick God by pretending to repent and then go on as he had before. When we confess our sins as we do probably daily and week by week as a church, we need to be sure that our repentance is genuine. Pharaoh's wasn't. And we see that in the use of that phrase, this time. And Moses smelt a rat. In verse 30, Moses told Pharaoh that he still didn't really fear or honor God. And lo and behold, in verse 34, at the end of the chapter, when Moses stretched out his hands to God and the seventh plague ended, Pharaoh again refused to let God's people go. Each time Pharaoh reinforces his disobedience by comforting himself after each plague that everything is not lost, that it's still all to play for. That's part of the pattern by which he hardens his heart. In verse 7, after the death of the livestock, he checks to see what had happened. And when he heard that none of the livestock of the Israelites was harmed, his heart was hardened, we read. The boils came and went. So that was okay with no long-term damage. 
And again in verse 12, at the end of that, we read, The Lord hardened his heart. In verses 31 and 32, he took comfort from the fact that not all of the crops were destroyed. And when the storm was over, in verse 43, we read that he sinned again and hardened his heart. So the central question remains in this chapter, the state of Pharaoh's heart. The seventh plague, the hail, was sent in verse 14 on, in the words we read in our text, on you yourself, which means literally on your heart. The hardening of Pharaoh's heart is described in the passage in three ways. In verse 7, his heart was hardened. In verse 12, God hardened his heart. And in verse 34, Pharaoh hardened his heart. So did Pharaoh harden his own heart? As Todd set out last Sunday, a habit begins with a single decision that then, when it's repeated again and again, becomes a behavior and becomes ingrained. A heart can be hardened in that way. Pharaoh resisted God's commands and with each plague looked for a way out without having to repent, seeking comfort that things were not too bad. That led to a hardened heart. Or did God harden Pharaoh's heart? God is sovereign over all things, even over Pharaoh's heart. But even if God is sovereign, Pharaoh is still responsible. What about those whose hearts are hardened against the good news of the Lord Jesus. It's God who calls to faith and Christ who enables us to receive his call. We don't save ourselves by our own decision. God saves us, but some continue to reject his call. Their hearts are hardened. And Pharaoh shows us here how a heart can be hardened. Those who reject the gospel remain responsible for their own hardness of heart in refusing God's gracious call, even though God remains sovereign over all things. Third and finally, I would like to look at obedience, which may be a bit more cheerful. So in contrast to Pharaoh's disobedience, we see that Moses has become the obedient servant of God, the man of the word of God, the one who now carries out God's commands without demur or question. If you recall from earlier chapters, Moses wasn't like that. He was the hesitant younger brother, the reluctant man, the man of excuses, who said, I can't do it, God, please send someone else. The man teetering on the edge of disobedience has become the one who is now fully obedient to God, and as a result is decisive, fearless, eloquent, able to confront even the mighty Pharaoh, the absolute ruler of the great superpower of the age, to deliver God's word and God's works, severe statements and actions of condemnation and punishment. God abhors Pharaoh's disobedience. And it's up to Moses, not Aaron, to speak and perform all the acts that God requires. And Moses is now ready and willing to do so. God has been at work in Moses' life to prepare him to be the decisive leader of God's people in their exodus, their departure from slavery, undertaking God's work with growing confidence in the grace and power of God. And as Moses stands before Pharaoh and his retinue, it's now no longer he who cannot stand before them, but they who can no longer stand before Moses. In verse 11, even the magicians, who originally had run rings round him, could no longer stand before him. God protects Moses and enables him to do all the demanding tasks set before him. Pharaoh's disobedience is now in stark contrast with Moses' obedience. How do we become obedient to God? Moses' obedience is an example to us, but it wasn't perfect. There is one whose obedience was perfect. 
the Lord Jesus Christ. He was obedient to everything that God commanded, even to death on the cross. His life was completely sinless. And it's not just that he is an example to us, but at his birth he became one of us, taking on our human nature. And in his death, he took on himself our sin, paying its price in full, so that we are reconciled to God through faith in Christ. And in that faith we are united with Christ, so that not just his death for us, but also his sinless obedience in his life is counted as ours. The good news is that our salvation does not depend on our own obedience, but on the obedience of Christ, which is imputed to us, which is given to us through faith in him, in all its perfection. And in union with Christ as God's new covenant people, rescued from sin and death in the exodus that Christ achieved on the cross, we are called to obey God from the love that he puts in our hearts as his children, seeking to obey him not out of fear and not in our own strength, but by the power of the Holy Spirit poured out on us by the grace of God through Christ because of our union with him. We are called and empowered to be obedient to God in living all our days for his righteousness and glory. Let's pray together.